What is the gospel, and how should we understand the story of our salvation? How do we respond to that story? And better yet, how can we share the story with others? Join us today as we discuss those questions and more with Father John Ricardo, the author of the new book, Rescued, The Unexpected and Extraordinary News of the Gospel. I'm Father Dave Pavonk, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavonk, and I'm president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And we're talking today about being transformed by the gospel. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, good to have you, and Dr. Scott Hahn, a pleasure. Our guest today is Father John Ricardo. He is a priest of the Archdiocese of Detroit and founder of Acts 29. Father Ricardo also hosts a popular radio show, Christ is the Answer and is the author of the new book, Rescued, the Unexpected, and the Extraordinary, the Extraordinary News of the Gospel. Welcome, Father. Thanks, Father. Pleasure to have you here. Joy to be here. The question I always ask is, why did you write this book? Uh, so short answer would be, because it'd be my conviction that most Catholics, let alone most people outside the church, have never heard the Gospel. How's which that for is, provocative? Yeah, yeah, which that, is pretty remarkable, because don't they go to church every week? Uh -huh. I mean, that's a pretty stunning indictment, isn't it? I mean, that, you're on the front line, so you must know, but I thought the whole point of the council was to open up the gospel. Yeah, it's supposed to. I don't think it worked. Yeah. Sorry, so here's, here's how I'd say it. So John Paul in Catechesi Tridente, uh, he writes this. He says, the, the proclamation of the kerygma, which is what I mean by the gospel, right. not Matthew, Mark, Luke, we'll and John. We'll talk exactly the, what that is. The core message of the gospel, he says, the proclamation of the kerygma is supposed to be such that a person is gradually overwhelmed and then brought to a decision to surrender their whole lives to Jesus. So imagine if he and I were to stand up in any, any church in the country this coming Sunday and just ask, quick show of hands here, how many of you have been overwhelmed by the gospel? Yeah. <laughs> Crickets. You know, how many people here have made a decision to surrender their whole lives to Jesus? Yeah. In a given parish, what do you think mm -hmm. you'd get? Five, ten, yeah. maybe, right? And I think the reason for that is uh, the lectionary. Hmm. So the lectionary presupposes that you know scripture. You yeah. hope. How many people know scripture? I mean, people will tell you, like, I don't understand the Bible, right? That's why you do what you do. And so what are you and I left with doing? You know, I got three readings, which most people don't know they have anything to do with each right, other. Right. And you got 10 minutes, make it kind of funny, give them something practical and don't be too long. Right. Yeah. That's a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote this in a particular way because this is how the Lord's led me to understand the kerygma, the core message of the gospel. And because I want to tell as many people as I can about it. Right. You know, it reminds me of people who might know what a layup is, a free throw, a three-pointer, but they've never done a layup. You know, they know the rules, right. but they've never played the game. They know the creed, but they don't know the ruler, the mm -hmm. king of kings. And, That's right. and so they know it at one level, but they have the, the experience of, well, you know, what Scripture says. You have to have ears that hear, eyes that see, right. and that is exactly what a conversion is needed you know, and it's also something that isn't just over and done in the past, but that kind of conversion has to be ongoing. Right, 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 right. I've spent two years, the last two years, more or less, preaching this wherever I go, starting usually with priests and then with other people. But So I've gotten to the point now where somebody will ask me a question. So like, nobody calls a priest and says, hey, I just want to tell you how great my life is, right? I mean, if you come to see me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you come to see me because you got problems, yeah. right? And so I've just learned, before I do anything, I'm going to say to you, you know, I'm going to ask you, why are you here? And then I'm going to say, before I answer that or try to help you, can I just tell you how I see the world? Mm -hmm. And I'll put on a pair of glasses. Because if you don't understand how I see the world, it's nothing's going to make, gonna make sense, sense, right? right? right. <laughs> so I can do this in five minutes. Yeah. And every single time I do it, I mean, like, without fail, every time I do it, 
I'm thinking of a young woman who probably was the most beautiful woman mm -hmm. I've ever met in my life, 28 years old, stunningly attractive, very successful. Her life's a train wreck. So I asked her, I said, can I tell you how I see the world? She says, yeah. I got done with this. She was bawling her mm -hmm. eyes out. She looked at me and she says, why have I never yeah. heard this right. before? Yeah. 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 It's, it's sad how many times I've heard something like that. You know, yeah. you talk, you preach, you say, I've never heard this before. It's like, that's just a stunning. Uh, um, maybe just uh, one of the things I appreciate about your book, Father, was you, the kerygma, the gospel, but you actually start in, in Genesis mm -hmm. and kind of beginning to unpack that. What, what motivated you to do that, to start there? Well, because one of the ways, that for me, anyway, so the kerygma is four parts, right? So the goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin, and then our response to what God's right. done. So if it's the goodness of creation, I mean, where are you going to start? You're going to start in Genesis. And the way I formulate it is just by asking the question, like, why is there something rather than nothing? Yes, that was great. That's a huge question, right? I mean, I was doing this in a high school retreat, and a kid came up to me in the break and said, I haven't heard a word you said since you said that. <laughs> I just keep thinking about that. Like, yeah. I have no idea. Like, I've never thought about that question. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he's in good company. Uh, William James said that's the darkest question in all philosophy. Why is there being rather than nothingness? Yeah. Uh, and Martin Heidegger was so haunted by it that mm. he retreated into the Black Forest for weeks at a stretch. It was just, I mean, it just overwhelmed him. Yeah. Uh, you know, getting back to Scott's analogy about basketball, people are not fascinated by the game. That's why they're not interested in learning how to play it. Uh, who was that guy that quit? He, he, I mean, he was an incredible star. He just stopped playing because it wasn't fun anymore. Right. He couldn't be invested emotionally in it. So how do we trigger, how do we catalyze uh, that experience? Well, so for me, it's, it, it, uh, I mean, Genesis in general, but it's, it's especially Genesis 1, right. and it's Genesis 1.16, where um, whoever, I'll, I'll let you tell me who's writing Genesis, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's got something in his hand, and he's writing on some sort of animal skin or whatever, right? And, and it's, you know, on, you know, he made the sun, he made the moon, and then there's a, in my mind, this is such a comical line, it's kind of this pause, and he goes, he made the stars, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he made the stars, too? Like, this is a throwaway line? Right. Like, do you know how many stars there are? Right, yeah. There's, there's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Yeah. There, our galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion, billion stars. stars in it. I mean, I'm the doing, universe, is, here. The uh, universe yeah. is 46 billion light years across. That's 46 billion times 5.88 trillion yeah. miles across. And, oh, yeah, he just made these, too. I forgot to mention that. Right. And... So the point in, in the goodness of creation and who this God is, is whatever our image of God is, it's wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, I pray, I'm always having an image of God when I'm praying, and I'm just thinking like, oh, I hope he can come through. Mm. You hope he can come through? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> right. yeah. Like, do you know the majesty and the splendor and the power right. Right. Yeah. of this God, and yet, in this creation that he's made, without any effort whatsoever, hmm. the creature he starts, most yeah, yeah. loves yeah. isn't us. It's you right? Yeah. by name, Regis. It's you, mm. Father Dave. It's you, Scott. It's me. It's everybody who's watching. He knows everything about us. And that's unfathomable to me. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's important to make a move. Okay, he's created the galaxies, the hundreds of billions of stars. Why would he be concerned about me? How would he even know about me? And if he does know every detail of my body, my subatomic particles, you know, so what? You know, to make man in his image and likeness in verse 26 of Genesis 1, to me is like the move that suddenly stuns us and makes us realize, you know, as far as God's greatness is concerned, subatomic particles and galaxies are maybe an inch apart in terms of vastness. And so, his greatness is not diminished by his concern for us. That's his greatness. Right. Yeah. Right. The fact that of all of the galaxies and the molecules, we alone bear his image and likeness, and he made this for us, he gets nothing out of it by making it or by redeeming it. It's for our sake, not for his. You know, you talk about Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey, or Virgil's Aeneid, and how that gave the story to make sense out of life for the, the Greeks and then the Romans except that it's almost all fictional, or right. at least it's fictionalized. And so to grasp the story 
that is the truth of reality, the vastness and yet the personalism of right. every single yeah. one of us. He's more concerned about me than I am yeah. and my loved ones. And, and so, and then contrast that with the ancient Near Eastern myths, right? So, so I went to University of Michigan. I was a, you know, LSNA major, which meant I had fun. So I took a lot of mythology classes and, and everyone would tell uh, the students, you know, like pretty much every ancient culture had its own mythology and they're all more or less the same. That's just rubbish. Right. There is nothing yeah, yeah, like yeah, the creation yeah, yeah, accounts yeah, in the ancient yeah, Near Eastern yeah. myths, right? The ancient Near Eastern myths, there's many gods, they're not good, um, right. they're all at war with each it's other. Yeah. They make man, the male, at a certain point because they need a slave. They don't make him for friendship. They make them to do the work they don't want to do. They make woman for one reason, right? For children and for pleasure. Yeah. I mean, in a world like that, there's no point to work, there's no point to marriage, there's no right. point to sexuality, there's no point to living. So what it rains? Despair. Right. That sounds like our world, right. Right? right? Into that world comes Genesis. And God says, no, 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 there's one God, it's just me. And I'm really good, and everything I made, I made out of love, and the highlight of everything I made is you, and I made you for friendship. Yeah, we occupy the summit of the stair. Uh, yeah. t two bookends uh, have, have struck me. One, of uh, all of these stars that God took the trouble to make and, and, and stick somewhere in the cosmos. And then at the other extreme, he has counted every hair on your head. Mm -hmm. I mean, he takes an infinite mm -hmm. interest in you. I mean, that Chesterton has that great line. What I like about this God is he takes such an interest in his secondary creatures. Yeah. That's yeah. us. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we're not really the protagonists of this drama. God is, That's but right. he cares about us. Yeah. But in, in another part where you spend a great talk in the story, the character in the story is the one who messes this up. And you speak about the serpent, and you spend a lot of time speaking about that. And I just got a little bit of pushback recently. They said that I talked about the evil one, and that's not how they think he is. He's just kind of out off, off the side, not paying attention to us. I would suggest you differ with that opinion. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think one of the reasons why so many people don't experience the gospel as unexpected and extraordinary is because they don't know the bad news. And we never talk about the bad news or we rarely yeah. talk about the right. bad news. Yeah. And the bad news is not bad. The bad news is horrific, yeah. right? Yeah. So if the, if the first part of the kerygma is why is there something rather than nothing, and the answer is because God in His goodness created it out of love, the next question is, well, then how did it get all messed up? Right. Yeah. And the scriptural answer is, I don't think this, I don't, see, I don't think I, you probably taught this, I just wasn't listening to you. Although I read you, I didn't have you for class. I don't think most people hear this. So we talk about sin and its consequences. So um, the consequence of sin is separation from God, which is true. If you told me that at 18, I would have met that with a resounding yawn. Like, yeah. Yeah. Who cares, you know? Yeah. But it's not just separation from God, right? The result of the fall is that when the enemy deceives our race, this creature who was an angel, who was good, who rebels out of envy of yeah. us, mm -hmm. of God to be sure, but of us and, and what God's plan for us, he tricks us into doing what? Into selling ourselves into slavery to powers that we can't compete against. Mm -hmm. I never heard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I experienced it. I never heard right, exactly, it, right? Exactly. And and it's so easy to prove, right? I mean, like the the powers especially are two, right? Death and sin, which especially in Romans, which you know better than anybody, are best written in capital letters. Yeah. Mm. Death's a kingdom. Right. It reigns, yeah. right? It lords over creation. Yeah. And so is sin. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to prove because I'll just I won't ask you because you don't have any experience of it. I'll ask you. Um, have you ever done anything that you didn't want to do? No. That you knew you shouldn't do? Right. That you hated doing? Yeah. And you did it anyway? You did it, yeah. Like all the time? Right. Why? Yeah. Because yeah. sin's a power. Yeah. Yeah, the mystery of iniquity, uh, St. Paul yeah. uh, calls it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Catholic doctrine is for so many Catholics like a shopping list. You go out and get these groceries, and you come home, and you forget to eat them. Yeah. and they spoil. <laughs> you know, original sin, oh, I got that. Well, that is the death of the soul, the Catechism yeah, says. Yeah. Concupiscence, that is the reign of death, and not just physical decay, but death, the prince of death. Right. You know, the bad news is much worse than people realize. It's not a runny nose, it's not a common cold, it's more than a pandemic. 
Yeah, that's right. And this isn't like, oh, you're just kind of exaggerating, that's hyperbole. No, actually, it's understating it. Yeah, and if, and if you've ever lost mm -hmm. loved ones, uh, then you know it up close and personal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I buried my mom, my dad, my brother in two and a half years, mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember standing at my mom's bedside as she's about to leave this earth. My father left us a fair amount of money. We had great doctors. We had great medical care. And nothing makes you feel as impotent it, it, it as standing at the, at the bed of someone you love, and, and it's going to take her. You know, and you're helpless to And I can't it. do anything. Right. Why? Because yeah. death's a power. Yeah. Yeah. It's not supposed to be here. Right. It came as a consequence of yeah. sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now it rains. Yeah. Which is why if some guy comes along and says, look, I, I intend to break that sham kingdom in two, the kingdom of death and sin, you're going to take notice. You, know, you ought to pay That's attention. That's galvanizing. You should. Please but, bind the strong man. And I think that that's what you do just so very well is you lay out this is the situation. I think some of the things that they know, people know that they're living in it, but nobody's ever shown, shine light on that and, and help them mm -hmm. to see that, which I think you did really, really beautifully in that. We have much more to talk about, so please stay with us as we continue Franciscan University Presents. Consider the worldview presented in Genesis. There is only one God. He's good. He is complete. He needs nothing outside himself. God created everything out of nothing, freely, effortlessly, and generously. Everything he created was out of love. Everything God created is good. The highlight of everything God created is the human person, made in his image and likeness. The end, the purpose, and the reason every human person was created is to be divinized. Father John Ricardo, from his book Rescued, The Unexpected and Extraordinary News of the Gospel. We become members of a family that originates in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but that Holy Spirit overshadows the Blessed Virgin, so we become her children as well. People knew that when the Messiah came, that this promise would call them as a covenant people to be what? A light to the nations. And everybody is invited to walk through that door of mercy. The only key we need is the one that each one of us has, that it is my sin that opens up the mercy of God, amen? Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We are talking about being transformed by the gospel, which is good news, correct? How good? Kind of. It's better than that. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So, it's good just doesn't seem enough. So here's the image. So imagine, um, imagine the four of us are sitting, we're, we're living in France. It's June 7th, 1944. So it's the day after D-Day, right? So the last four years, our country's been invaded. It's occupied by a tyrant. We've lost brothers to you know, gas chambers, forced work camps in Germany. No one's coming for us and yeah. we have no future, right? So imagine we're sitting there, we're drinking some coffee one day. Paper boy, bad coffee by the way, right? Okay. Paper boy throws in a newspaper. I open it up and you guys ask me, so what happened yesterday? Right. Yeah. And I go, well, nothing much. Looks like the allies landed. Right. <laughs> I mean, would I read it that way? Right. Like, are you out of your mind? Yeah. Like, somebody came. Somebody came to fight for us. Like, the Allies landed at Normandy. Like, yeah. we're going to get out. We're going to get free. They're going to come overcome the tyrant. Yeah. The gospel is, extra, is yeah. infinitely better than that, right? Yeah. Infinitely better than that. Because right. Right? the message of the gospel is God has come to fight for you. You mean so much to him. Right. I mean so much to him that God has come to fight for but me. But don't, don't forget that there's always an interval between D-Day and V-Day. I mean, victory uh, in Europe uh, will take a while. Oh, yeah, we're, but, we're, we're living in that right now. Right, mm, yeah. Clearly. Yeah, but the victory has been declared. It's definitive. Yeah. Christ is going to win. Absolutely. And, the, and the, to me, the reason why that's so helpful, again, for me anyway, is just because I, I have to find some comparative to understand how powerful the gospel is. This yeah. is not ordinary news. Yeah. This is good news. This is good news. This. This is life-changing yeah, 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 news. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Campbell's soup is good. <laughs> this is great. This is beautiful. You know, but the problem is, getting back to that first point, 
is that, you know, like the prophets of ancient Israel, what bothered them was not that their fellow Israelites were in exile, so much as that they didn't know they were in exile. You know, for Frenchmen to be occupied by the Nazis and to not know it, you know, that would say, yeah, ho-hum, we're liberated, whatever that means, yeah, you know. Right. And so to recognize the extent of the bad news is the key, the foil, for right. which you look and say, that is good. No, that's very, that's great, that's extraordinary. Well, because once I understand that I'm bound by sin and death, so once you've buried a loved one, once you've come face to face with death, once you've come face to face, which shouldn't take too long, with your own powerlessness mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. sin, then you recognize where you are. So Dan Daniel, for me, uh, it struck me this past Lent in a way it never has before. You know, the, the Israelites are where? They're in Babylon. Why? Because they rebelled against God. So what do they need to do? They need to repent. Great. That's not enough. It's a start. Someone needs to come and rescue us. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's us as a race, right? So in the season of Lent, we talk all the time about repent, repent, repent. Well, that's great. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. Return, return, return. And then someone come and fight for me. Because right. yeah. I can't do it. To I'm make powerless. Feel like it's actually possible. Yeah. I'm yeah. powerless against these things. So what happens? So yeah. God, God becomes a man, right? So here's the third part of the kerygma, uh, God's response to it. So what's he do? Um, he becomes a man hidden in, a, in, in human flesh mm. to rescue the creature that he most loves in this universe in a most clever way, yeah. right? So uh, I think it's Lewis in Mere Christianity says, you know, the story of Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has yeah. landed in disguise yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and calls us to embark on a great campaign of mm -hmm. sabotage. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that at the end. Yeah. That's the fun right. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, but if you show, you show a typical, you know, church-going person a, an image of Jesus in the manger and ask, what's he doing there? Why'd he come? I don't think they have an answer. Yeah. Yeah. If I show you a picture of the Allies landing at Normandy, yeah. and I ask you that question, yeah. why have they come? Yes. You have an immediate answer. They came right. to fight. Yeah. I think we're supposed to have the same answer when we look at Jesus. Well, well Father, in the uh, it's obvious that you've been arrested by this good news, but how did that happen? Did you have an encounter? Uh, did something uh, transform your life? Or I mean, Unless it's too personal, uh, I'd like to know because uh, you obviously uh, have been seized. Uh, you have this, you're in a kind of stupor uh, because of the good news. It, it's intoxicating. Well, how did that happen? How did you get drunk uh, on this message? Lots of ways. I, I had great parents who are both with the Lord now, and they, they laid the foundation. Uh, I had great siblings. You're not a convert. And, um, I'm, I'm a, no, I, I, I had abandoned the faith very intentionally, kind of like Edith Stein said, like I made a deliberate decision at a certain point in my life to stop yeah. actively living as a Christian. Um, but was always, I mean, even then I was always praying. Uh -huh. I always knew God. I was just Edging running your from bets. him. No, I was running from him. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was running, I was under the illusion that if I, that, that the best work. of both worlds well. is indulge every appetite here and then like repent Ice. and you get, you get it all. Yeah. And that's just a lie. Sort of like Augustine's father. Something like that. I'll put this off until the yeah. end. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the Lord just really powerfully broke into my life. And uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking of Philippians three, and you know, Paul says, "I strive to take hold of the one who's taken mm -hmm. hold of me." Yeah. That's that's how I, I see. experienced life. I feel like God just literally took hold of me. And you're said, a cradle convert. Yeah, both yeah. And absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you spend the time helping. Yeah, again, the, the vast majority of people in, in the pew, you ask them that question about who's been overwhelmed, why is Jesus in the manger? How do you bring that alive for them? What, what, is, what is your secret sauce that you're working with that, that actually animates that for the listener, for the person in the pew? Yeah, so um, there's a way to tell the story to be sure, but at least I find so much comfort in Romans 1 where Paul says uh, the gospel is the power of God mm -hmm. for salvation. Mm -hmm. And especially as a priest, I think what's so critical for that is um, the gospel's power, not the herald. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really freeing. Yeah. Yeah. Like we need to know what we're talking about <laughs> and we, we want to do everything we can to preach uh, sure. compellingly and attractively. But for everybody who's listening, I mean, the gospel itself is power. Right. Just open your mouth right. yeah. and mm -hmm. share it. But for me, the way I share it, especially with this third part, you know, like what has God done for us in Jesus? 
is to try to, so imagine looking at Jesus on a cross and ask the question, what is he doing there? Which even of itself sounds mm-hmm. like a really stupid question. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't look like he's doing anything. They're right? doing it to him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here's a man who's stark naked, ripped to shreds, uh, utterly humiliated, apparently defeated, you know, bleeding out in, in front of us, right? What, what do you mean, what is he doing there? Except, remember who this is. This is the one through whom a universe that's 46 billion light years across was created. Where do you get that nail? You can't nail God to a cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not like he has kryptonite. Right. There's only one way mm-hmm. Jesus can get on a cross. He has to want to be there. Yeah. Why in the world would he want to be there? And there's three answers classically in the faith, right? And, and I think most of us, especially now, we hear two of them. We never hear the third one. Mm-hmm. So the first is, so on the cross, Jesus is showing me the Father's love. Right? It's the guy with the afro behind home plate, you know, John three sixteen. right? Yeah. Um, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that we would not perish. Is that true? Absolutely. Blessed be God. It's not exhaustive though, right? right? Second thing he's doing is he's making atonement for me. So Paul says, what, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I mean, I do, but I don't, right? Mm-hmm so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Is that true? Absolutely, it's not enough. The third thing he's doing, which we never talk about, but what the fathers of the church incessantly preached, was Jesus is going to war on the cross. He's deceiving the deceiver Hmm. into bringing about his own destruction. And so, for me, this, I mean, you and I have talked about this several times, uh, Scott, but um, so I'm sitting in my chapel one day. This is set of years ago now, three, four years ago. It's right before Holy Week. And I'm just praying with the passion. And out of nowhere, and I mean nowhere, I hear two words in my head that I've never heard in my life. And the two words are ambush predator. <laughs> so I have a wacky imagination, but I also know how God talks to me. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, okay, mm-hmm. I think. Is this you? You know, so I I pull out my phone, I Google ambush predator, and I just start to laugh. So an ambush predator is a a creature which lies uh, motionless and still, camouflaged with its environments for one reason, to attract prey. And I mean, these things are everywhere. They're in the woods, they're in the water, they're in your house, sorry. Um, And I felt like the Lord just said, that's me. And as you read the fathers, Ephraim, Irenaeus, uh, Athanasius, Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Melito, on and on and on, this is the image. They don't use those two words, but this is the image that they use. Augustine talks about how Jesus is, uh, is the incarnation and him on the cross is like a mousetrap. Mm-hmm. You know, his humanity is the cheese. <laughs> And his yeah. divinity is the bar. <laughs> and he's trying to get the devil to, to bite, and he bites, right? Um, Gregory of Nyssa uses the image of a fish hook. Um, Isidore of Seville uses the image of, um, of a fish hook. The genealogy is the line, and the one holding the rod is the father mm. who's trolling for Satan, <laughs> you know? Deceiving um, the deceiver, clickbait. destroying the destroyer. Oh, it's just spectacular, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's why Gibson, at the, um, in The Passion of the Christ, does that really strange scene right after Jesus dies. You know, there's a tear that falls mm. from the sky. Yeah. And then you, sh- you see the figure of Satan standing on cracked ground. It's, it's less than a second, mm-hmm. I think, on the, in the movie. And he's screaming. It is not a scream of glee. It's a scream of like, oh no, <laughs> like what have I just done? And it's not just what have I done, it's what has he done? Yeah, yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was doing it to him, yeah. he was doing it to me while And he so was what dying. the Lord does yeah. is invades hell. It's like, it, you know, we, you have to think uh, so um, figuratively here, mm-hmm. or, you know, whatnot. Um, but it's almost like the Lord's wanting to get swallowed by death because yeah. he's going to bind the strong man yeah. and he's going to assail him. I mean, that's th- that passage in, uh, especially in Luke's translation of when Jesus drives out the demon and the Pharisees say, uh, they accuse him of doing it by 
the Prince of mm -hmm. Demons. And he says, if I'm doing it by the Prince of Demons, who are y'all doing yeah, it by, right? right? Yeah. And then he says, when, when a strong man guards his possessions, you know, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than him yeah. assails him and overcomes him, then his possessions can go free. I, I think, for me anyway, especially for men, most men have an image of Jesus that goes something like this. He's kind, he's gentle, he's compassionate, yeah. he's merciful, he plays with children, he likes kittens. I mean, you know. <laughs> he's a wimp. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's all these things yeah. to be sure, yeah, but he's so much more. Right. Jesus yeah. is Lord, which is not the ending of a prayer. Yeah. It's a reality, which means if he is, nobody else is. Right. And it means he's absolutely and utterly unconquerable. <laughs> yeah. And he's the one who's calling you and me to follow him. Yeah, you know, we have so sentimentalized uh, the figure of Christ. Uh, we, we picture a redeemer as a guy who, as a private citizen, would probably recycle. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's not, that's not the figure of our uh, conquest of the world. And especially in, in this age that we're living in, where there's so much anxiety and there's so much fear, and it looks like you know, the church is just, you know, last one out, turn the lights off. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it just looks horrible, right? right. Yeah. It's so important to remember who he is, what he's done, yeah. that you're on the right side of history, right. yeah. and then he's calling us to engage the culture and to win them to him. And yeah. a couple of t uh, several times actually uh, already today, you've spoken of the word power. And, and I think that that's something that's lacking void in most people's spiritual life is this power that Jesus came. So stay with us. Uh, we'll be back. We'll speak a little bit more about the power of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for Jew first and then Greek. For in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live. St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter one, verses 16 and 17. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty, and programs? A place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record in the Communication Arts Studio here at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment and members of our theology faculty, Dr. Regis Martin and Dr. Scott Hahn, and I are discussing being transformed by the gospel with Father John Ricardo. We spoke about this power that the Lord has and all that he's done for us, what he's freed, and there has to be some kind of response to this. And that would be? Yeah, I mean, you don't just go, hey, that is thanks good. a lot. Yeah, that I appreciate fantastic. that, you know, like dust off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, what, what is the reasonable, logical, intelligent, sane response to a God who made the universe, who became man by going to a cross to rescue you from a fate worse than anything you can imagine? <laughs> I mean, isn't it just to surrender? No. Like, who? Who would you possibly be able to trust more? Right. Yeah. Yes. And what would you want to negotiate with? Yeah, with? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing have, left yeah, to give. Yeah, you have. Right, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I mean, so um, faith is an intelligent response to what God has done. Once, once we understand what Jesus has done and what he's rescued us from, yeah. like, I, I'm made to entrust myself to somebody. Yeah, That's how we live. How, it shows how unbelief is so entirely unintelligent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's irrational not to surrender. Yeah. Right? Or surrender. What does that look like there? I mean, we use language like that. What does that look like for the average person who's watching our show? What does it look like for them to surrender? What, you can what, have my life. What are you asking? Amen. Yeah, you can have my life. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. You can, without it, condition. Yeah. Without and, boundaries. And, without... Yep. yep. My time, my money, no my body. No prenuptial. 
No prenup. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that, that validates the whole no, thing. Don't do okay. that. That's a bad okay. thing. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and of course, I got to do it every day. Mm. Right. I had a friend of mine. He was asked recently, uh, same same number of years ordained as me. When did you decide to become a priest? Uh -huh. And he said, this morning. Uh -huh. It's like, that's a great answer, right? Because really Paul is. says, right. you know, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. And yeah. the challenge of a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off living. the altar. Right, right, right. <laughs> so right. every day I have to crawl back onto the altar yeah. and go, here you are. Well, it's so you can it's have sort of life. like having a wife. You have to remind yourself and tell her each day, you know, I love you. Exactly. And let me show you how. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and so I think that's that showing is the that right, showing yes. is the response. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 So I mean, you know, uh, uh, Father Francis Martin used to say, "Show me your calendar, and show me your checkbook, mm -hmm. and I'll show you whether or not you've surrendered." Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> where you give your money, and where you give your time, would be a key way for you to understand who I'm serving. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it means you can have everything, and. Um, doesn't mean you have to sell everything, but it means you can have everything. Right, I'm yours, right, entirely right. yours, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the first part of the response, I think. But there's a second part, um, which is, I think, especially uh, challenging for us as Catholics. Because uh, in the Archdiocese of Detroit, Archbishop Vigneron uses this triad of encounter, grow, and witness. So we're, most people have never encountered, in a personal, transformative way, uh, God. Um, let alone grow, and I don't have a clue what to do with witness, you know, other than learn how to tell your story in an elevator or share your personal testimony. And there's a lot of value to that, but I don't think that's what it means to witness. I think there's a lot more than that. So one of the ways that we talk about it, we had two uh, Marine Corps majors call us one day uh, who've become good friends, and they just said, you guys sound a lot like Marines. Let me just share with you, she said, um, how we train our young um, leaders. And they train them to make it abundantly clear to the young soldiers um, that they have clarity on, we're doing X in order to Y. So we're landing at Okinawa in order to what? We're, we're dropping into Iraq in order to what? Jesus sends us as disciples in order to <laughs> what? Right. You know, yeah. really. I mean, he calls us for friendship. Right? The first call, the disciples be with him. But then he sends us to do something, right? And so, uh, so Matthew 5, you know, no one lights a lamp, puts it underneath a basket, puts it on a stand so that everybody in the house can see, right? Um, why don't you put it under a basket? Because it's stupid. Makes no sense, right? You don't light a lamp to hide it. Who's the lamp? I am. Remember the Greek word? Leknos. That's the lamp. So it's this little tiny portable hand lamp filled with oil. I'm the leeknos. I'm the lamp. Yeah. Every day God wants to pick me up. He wants to move me from room to room in the house, which is the world, and put me on a stand, which is just wherever I happen to be. And so we would say um, Jesus sends us in order to do five things, five words. And three of them are Peace Corps words, and two of them are Marine Corps words. <laughs> Or this family show. I know. Okay, so, okay. No, don't worry. We got you, bro. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the first, the first word is he sends us to be an agent of recreation, right? So uh, Easter Sunday is the beginning of the recreation of the universe, right? And the Lord's going to come back on VE Day, and yeah. he's going to make it all well. But until then, he wants to use us to recreate things. So maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a physician. Maybe I'm an attorney. Maybe I'm a professor. Maybe I'm a priest, maybe I'm a stay-at-home dad or a stay-at-home mom. Like, do everything I can so as to bring it into conformity with how the Father intended it to be, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. huh? Or an agent of transformation, same kind of principle. Or an agent of healing. You know, I, I'm amazed how many people, they don't think God still heals today, right? 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 So you want to talk about power. Jesus says, into whatever town you enter, preach the gospel, heal the sick in it. That's still true for us now, right. right? Physically, spiritually, emotionally. Those are the Peace Corps words. The Marine Corps words are um, against Lewis's language. He sends us to be an agent of sabotage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the weapons of truth and goodness and beauty and dignity and character and forgiveness and mercy and all those things, right, so that nobody misunderstands us. Um, or to be a leader or a member of the resistance. So I've been struck a lot lately by the, the French resistance 
It's one percent of the population because mm -hmm. the leaders didn't do anything, yeah. which is kind of an interesting image for us today. Um, and they did two things: they they built bridges, and they blew up bridges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and for us, you know, I, I think as as Christians, that means we share the story. That's building a bridge, and we blow up bridges, meaning those things are too strong. Yeah, we try to help dismantle those things which belong to like the anti-gospel. Help, yeah. help people understand why nothing else makes sense. Not straw men, take on the best arguments of the world and go, here's why that doesn't make any sense. So the, the world says there's no fall, there's no devil, there's, sure. there's, there's no demonic, no and yet there's, there's clearly still evil. Yeah. <laughs> which means now someone's to blame, so it's... It's the men, or it's the women, or it's the whites, or it's the blacks, or it's the rich, or it's the poor, it's the Yankee fans. You know, like, we, we got to blow Somebody up those bridges right, right, right. and help them understand. Right. I think those things are part and parcel of the response. Mm -hmm. Well, how are we doing? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really poorly, I think. Yeah. By every assessment in the church, the metrics are horrible. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's just so important to get back to the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> right? right. I, I don't want to pass the buck, but what the hell are the priests and bishops doing uh, to advance this agenda that you've outlined with such eloquence? Well, the first thing is they're exhausted. Uh -huh. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, so many of our brothers. Uh, I left parish ministry in the first month I realized uh, I'm in PTSD. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean it. I mean, like yeah. I was just, you get so used in parish life to just living with your head on a swivel going from trauma to trauma to trauma yeah. to trauma. I used to think it was a great gig. You worked an hour a week. I mean, like, how hard could that be? <laughs> then you realize, no, I got 12,000 children yeah. in the parish where I was at, and I was yeah. I was just at my wit's end. You were the is, only one. No, I had a couple of guys to help me, so so we had 4,000 people apiece. Well, your, your <laughs> so parish all... was also a hospital, an aircraft carrier. I mean, it was a major... It was big. I, I, yeah, and it was also fruitful. It was. But at the same time, you were evangelizing as someone who was obviously still in need of the medicine of mercy. And so, you know, talk about moving from maintenance to mission. You know, I, I understand why you were exhausted, but I also understand why the people in your parish were so bereaved, you know. Uh, it was a great loss. But in a certain sense, I think the Archbishop was sending you out into the world to evangelize, but also especially to mobilize priests, to yeah. re-evangelize them and lay leadership. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here with two of the most fruitful and zealous evangelical Catholic priests, mm -hmm. you know, reminds me so much of the evangelists mm -hmm. that I knew as an evangelical way back, you know. So I, I do believe that in the midst of this, we have bishops who will throw their priests under the bus, you know, at the least hint of something. You know, and I understand. But at the same time, what we need are bishops who are going to be commanders in chief, who are going to raise up the sergeants, you know, and the officers, mm -hmm. then to not paternalistically keep the laity at bay, but to enlist them as well. Well, and we know as priests, right? I mean, like, I have to constantly get re-evangelized. Yeah. I have to constantly be reminded that Jesus is Lord yeah. and, and to live in confidence. Because, again, the metrics are so bad, and it's yeah. so easy to be discouraged right. yeah. leading yeah. parish ministry, right? And so I think it, it, at, that's why at the heart of the work that I'm doing now is to really pour into priests. Yeah. A friend of mine is a priest and was just sharing with him and he said one of the things that he's working on is not making secondary things primary. That's right. And yeah. unfortunately, because of everything that's going on, so many get stuck on the secondary things. Right. And the yeah. primary thing is the proclamation of the gospel, that's right. which is to be received in power and transforming. And that is simply, um, yeah, I think, I think you're right to one degree about just being exhausted and tired. But the other is, is I think you're experiencing as well. The grace of God and being a part of that mission is, it's life-giving. You know, when I, when I go to bed at night, I'm tired, but I can't imagine not doing what I'm doing. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 the, and the life that it restores in me. And yeah. when parents go to bed, they're exhausted. Oh. And they might be traumatized, <laughs> too, you know, it's not by what hard. they have gone through. Yeah. And so what, what priests are doing, and what others, too, I mean, it really is a partnership of the clergy and the laity mm -hmm. that uh, tackles this thing. But I, I can't help but wonder if... Um, Paul doesn't nail it once again when he talks about uh, 
you've not received the spirit of slavery to fall back in mm. sin. You've received the spirit of sonship. Mm. So set your mind on things above mm -hmm. rather than on things below. And so there is such a fundamental and simple decision that we have to make, not just every day in the morning, but every day throughout the day, mm. and that is to set our minds on things above. That's right. And that's what the Holy Spirit enables us to do because the bad news that the networks convey to us, it's so much worse than we expected. It's almost like gravity to focus on the things below and to be traumatized by that. And then when you focus on the things above, you realize, okay, this is good news. This is great. This is extraordinary. But it's so fantastic, it's going to strike everybody else's fantasy unless you can teach them or enable them to set their minds on things above because then it's like, wow, the good news is much better than the bad news is bad. Mm -hmm. And I need to be reminded of that several times a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's important for us as clergy to, to do that. And, and that's not to say that we dismiss the bad things that are going on. Right. But I travel a lot. There are amazing, wonderful, blessed things like you're doing, Father, mm -hmm. that, that it, we get a tendency, it's, oh, it's so bad. It's like that character right. that with the cloud always over them. I'm just not going to live in that world. Right. So I'm just not right. going to, I'm not going to yeah. deny yeah. all the stuff that's going on, but I'm also not going to live there. And, and, and one of the things you ask, yeah. My experience at the university is is that I'm also not doing this alone. Is that mm -hmm. there's you and there's mm -hmm. you and there's our students, and that's what makes this so I think engaged and exciting. That it's not just me. It's it's this community that's mm -hmm. come together with a common purpose, a common vision, and being able to do what the Lord's asking us to do. And you unfortunately, know. a lot of guys don't have that. Exactly, they're alone, exactly. right? I so think that's it, absolutely. To the be case. sure, the front line is marriage and family, but everybody knows that. Right. Nobody yeah. knows what's going on in the priest, unfortunately. Yeah. And priests tend to be really good at pouring themselves out. We tend to be really bad at asking you to get poured into. Amen. I mean, we, we just, we're terrible at it. I'm right. terrible at it. Right. Administering right. to the yeah. minister. And people in the trenches don't even know whether we're winning or losing. Yeah. You know, you're trying to stay awake, alert, you know, look for the enemy before he sneaks up on you. And so there is a bewilderment and a paralysis that sets in. Yeah. And so the need to re-evangelize those who have been de-Christianized or just simply sacramentalized, but not evangelized and converted. I mean, that to me is still the single greatest need of all. Yeah. And, and always will be a, pro, yeah. a clear, concise proclamation of gospel. And, and as you've said it very well, Father, it's not just this idea, but it's something to be experienced and then something that's be able to move us out from that. Amen. Amen. So I just invite you to stay with us for our final thoughts. By his death and glorious resurrection from the dead, Jesus has humiliated the enemy, destroyed death, transferred us to his kingdom, given us access to the Father, recreated us, rendered sin impotent, given us authority over the enemy, and sent us on a mission to get his world back. Father John Ricardo, from his book, Rescued, The Unexpected and Extraordinary News of the Gospel. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu where your faith and career can connect online. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our final segment. Regis, your final thoughts. Yeah, I scarcely know where to begin because so many splendid things have been said, uh, lapidary comments, I, I think, that, that should be etched in, in stone. Mm -hmm. but, but a couple of things pop into my head. Uh, we, we mustn't obsess about the darkness, although it surrounds us everywhere. 
Because if you do, then you'll only find evidence of darkness, mm-hmm. and you'll miss those shafts of light and hope uh, that, that we cling to, uh, and God wants us to radiate out into, uh, into the world. But uh, this much, I, I, I think, needs to be taken away. There's a story that has to be told, and it's got to be told tellingly. Uh, you've got to inspire people, lift them right out of their boring bourgeois lives. Mm-hmm. It's got to be so galvanizing that they're prepared to go to the wall on behalf of, of this narrative. And I, it seems to me that you've, you've captured it so well uh, in this, this marvelous uh, little book. That there's a, a line uh, in Aquinas that, that I always uh, r- refer to. He, he's asking, I think in, in the commentary on the metaphysics of Aristotle, he wants to know what is it that the poet and the philosopher have in common? Because they really are kindred spirits. And the answer is the sense of the marvelous, Mirandum. They're both struck Mm. by beauty Mm. and they pursue it. And you in your priestly ministry uh, are certainly uh, pursuing it as well. And yet the increase, the yield is so much greater than one would get from say reading Aristotle or or even the commentary on Aristotle. I mean, you're down in the trenches Mm. and you're transforming lives. Mm. So keep doing it. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Regis. And I would also say just to both of you as well is that what you do in the classroom, Mm. like Mm. what you guys do in the classroom does that transformation as well. So please don't sell yourself short Mm. with that. Scott. You never learn something as much as when you have to teach it. Mm -hmm. So let's tell our people, go out there and teach. Mm. Um, My first point would be thank you for writing Rescued. Uh, it is a renewal of the gospel precisely by going back to antiquity and rediscovering what Melito and Irenaeus, all the way to Maximus. You know, it's, it's stunning to me to read these quotes and to recognize that what is front and center has somehow ended up backstage. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah. we've got to bring this back. The next thing I would say is that if people read this and reflect upon this, they're going to reread the gospels and the epistles and say, oh my goodness. Jesus was doing something on the cross. It wasn't just done to him, and he was accepting it passively. Mm. That ambush predator thing is just such a, an, a sign of sacred stealth to show that he was not losing his life, he was giving it. Mm. He wasn't the victim of Roman in, in violence or injustice or even satanic contempt. You know, he was the victim of divine love, divine mercy. The father didn't turn away for three hours so that he could bear the brunt of paternal rage. Never was the sacred humanity of Jesus so lovely to the father as when together in a unity of operations, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit were basically absorbing all of the venom of this serpent and then turning it into this life-giving love. As we contemplate Jesus on the cross, your work helps priests and laity recognize that this is the single greatest act of love. And I I just, I do think that a lot of Catholics suffer from a kind of penal substitutionitis that afflicted me as a Protestant and many others too, that you're like, if that's how a father treats his only beloved son, Mm. yikes, Mm. you know. But to see that this is a love that is stronger than death, that turns death into a prayer, pain into passion, suffering into sacrifice, and not just back then and there, but for us here and now to enlist, to join in on that. I mean, it's like the good news is almost too good to be true. You know, it's amazing how unamazed we are at this amazing grace. And it's like, this is so much more than Catholic talking points, articles of the creed. Let's be renewed by this. Let's be ignited by this. And let's go out and become supernatural arsonist to set the world ablaze. Yeah. Okay. Your final thought. Uh, so final thought is this. So uh, at the heart of our work, th- this ministry that I uh, get to be a part of right now, uh, we would say that it, everything flows from three fundamental convictions which guide everything we do. The first conviction is this, that the, the world's crying right now in a very particular way. Um, it's been crying since the fall, right? But it's crying right now um, in that we're, we're literally losing the will to live. Mm. Uh, I think 2018 was the first time in 100 years that the life expectancy in the United States had declined for a third consecutive year. Mm. And then when COVID came, it just got worse, right? And we're dying because of despair. So suicide, opioid addiction, uh, cirrhosis of the liver amongst young adults. Um, second conviction is Jesus founded the church 
to be the means by which the world's cry would get answered. People to encounter the Father's love, come to know their identity as His beloved sons and daughters, uh, all the power of the transformation of the Holy Spirit, but the church is crying in so many ways, mm -hmm. right, which we don't mm -hmm. even need to go into. Sure. But the third conviction is this, and this is probably the thing uh, that I might just want to really leave everybody with. Uh, you're not alive right now by chance. Mm -hmm. God could have created you and me to be alive in Guatemala in the eighth century, sure, sure. but He didn't. He chose me to be alive right now, and He's blessed me with natural and supernatural gifts, and you with natural and supernatural gifts. And I find so much comfort from Joan of Arc, who's uh, what I wear around my wrist, who, you know, at one point in her life says, I'm not afraid. God is with me. I was born for this. Mm -hmm. And that's not just true of Joan. That's true of every single person right now. You were born for this moment. And in the, in the middle of a world which is so riddled with anxiety and fear and discouragement and despair, just to know mm -hmm. you were born for now and you have nothing to be afraid of because God is with you and he has no rival. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Uh, if you would like more information, you're able to get an article that was written by a father and just uh, write the website, which is on your screen, that allows you to be able to receive that. Uh, father, just again, want to thank you for being with us, listening to and reading through your book. I was struck with this uh, desire, uh, this sense of gratitude, right? And I think the Lord would knew that we would be in that place. We just want to say thank you, but like good news doesn't sound enough. Thank you. It's like, but when I think of what the Lord has done for us and how he's intervened in our life and how he's intervened in our world and how he provides us, it's like, ah, oh, we just want to say thank you. So like right now, there's just this deep uh, excitement that in about an hour I get to celebrate Mass. <laughs> you know, it, it really, right. no, it's, it's, that, it's that perfect thank you. It's the yeah. only thank you that satisfies and, and really allows us to encounter. I'll often say when I celebrate Mass, particularly in a parish, I said, did you come here expecting your life to change? And the reality is the same thing. Most people don't. Uh, but I think that the Eucharist is this encounter with Jesus that brings all that you've talked. If, if, yeah. if we've encountered the Lord, all that you've talked about alive. So uh, I, I just want to say thank you for you, but thank you to the Lord and what he's done. Amen for us and, and just pray that that this reality would become the reality of all the people that have listened. How about you close us with prayer, Father? Yeah, I'd be honored. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, as we uh, just think about what Father Dave just said, uh, the line of the psalm just comes to mind, what can we possibly give back to you for all that you have done for us? And just as he said there that we would lift high the chalice of salvation, let us be reminded every time we go to Mass and all throughout every moment of the day, just what it is that you've done for us in your Son, Jesus. Fill us with gratitude. Move our hearts by the power of your Spirit to surrender, to give everything to you, and send us out into the world as joyful and attractive witnesses of the power of the gospel. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, sir. My joy. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com, where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.